Legacy Baptist Church, so glad that you're here today to worship together. And this morning, as we begin our service, we're going to be reading from Psalm 18. Psalm 18 this morning, verses 30 to 32, and I'm going to ask Brother Mark that he come and read that for us today. Psalm 18, verses 30 to 32 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is a God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. Amen. Let's pray this morning as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we're so thankful to be in your house. We're thankful for your faithfulness uh, to us. We're thankful for the beautiful weather you've given us today. And Lord, we seek to worship you today in all that we say and do in the singing. Lord, I pray that you bless that. And I pray that you be with every aspect of the service that would be honoring to you. And Lord, I pray as the uh, pastor prepares to preach your word, Lord, that you prepare our hearts even now. Lord, you know the need of everyone who is here today, Lord, and I pray that you'd speak to them. And everyone who hears the preaching of the word would walk out of this place changed and closer to you. And we pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Let's all stand up, please, as we sing, There is power in the blood. Sorry, give me a second. All right, there is power in the blood. Verse 1, let's start it. <laughs> <clears throat> On the first. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you our evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power. 
in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working now in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. I mean, standing for our next hymn, I am resolved. I am resolved. to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to Just one, he had the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he says. Just a few announcements for this morning. Of course, our 11 o'clock service, our 11 a.m. service is always over in the East Wing. And after the service, if you'd like to join us at the Legacy Cafe, there's always coffee and tea. We can enjoy the fellowship of one another over there. And uh, today we'll be continuing our True North, which is our college and career uh, Bible study. That will be uh, every Sunday except for the first of the month. Uh, so we look forward to that over uh, at 11 o'clock. And then, of course, this week, our weekly Bible fellowship that's resumed after our Easter break. And um, if you don't know where your location is, you can come and ask myself uh, or pastor. We have a location in Mississauga, one in Brampton, and one in Milton as well, different days of the week. And actually, this Wednesday, our Mississauga 
uh, weekly Bible fellowship meets in different houses, but this Wednesday will be here at the church. So if you are close by and you'd like to be a part of the Bible study, uh, we'll be here over in the East Wing. We will start at 7 o'clock, and uh, we're currently going through the book of Genesis and looking at the creation. So it's always a great time to fellowship and then as well to study uh, God's Word together. And then just a few things looking ahead. Uh, on April 30th, we're having a baptism that day, and if you'd like to be baptized, you want more information about uh, being baptized or saved, and you, you've never joined the church, and you'd like to take that step of faith, uh, come and speak to myself or pastor, and we'd love to give you some more information. And then there's a few uh, things coming up uh, for different groups, so youth conference that's coming up in a few weeks. If you are planning to go to youth, youth conference and you haven't spoken to pastor or Mrs. Alcock about whether you're staying at the hotel, if you can speak to them today uh, to let them know they need to make a decision on that, so that would be helpful uh, and get whatever information else you need for that. And then ladies, there's a ladies retreat at Faithway and that is May 19th and 20th, so it's about a month away and uh, I know uh, Michelle sent an email out this morning uh, there's information there f about that. And as well, if you'd like to register, get a head start on that. If you go to the church website on the homepage, there's a sign-up page ready for you to register uh, to get things set up with Michelle. And then looking to uh, May, the weather is beautiful, and uh, we're starting to plan uh, our different outreach times. And of course, our outreach never ends. There's always tracks available there uh, at the table. We have more tracks over on the east wing, so if you ever need tracks, uh, for outreach or maps, that's all, always available. But May 27th, we're going to be having an outreach, and that's going to be uh, focusing on this area and trying to reach this community. And uh, if you remember the video that we took last uh, year, a church promotion video, we're going to be using that, trying to get it into community and try to get people coming out to visit the church. And then throughout the summer, and we'll, the closer we get to that, we have other uh, events planned to do outreach into the community. So whether you're out passing out tracks or here at the church, uh, we're going to do a yard sale in June and then a couple of things planned for July and August as well. But as we get closer to that, uh, we will let you know. But please be faithful in witnessing, being a witness, grabbing tracks. They're always there. Like I said, we have other re resources as well. We have uh, some Bibles. If you ever need a Bible, we'd love to give you one to be able to use as a tool to witness or different materials to try to be a help uh, to other people spiritually. So just so you know, that's all available to you. At this time, I'm going to ask the ushers if you would come forward um, as we prepare to take the offering this morning. And as they come, I'll pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful once again to be uh, here to worship you, and uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with this part of the service as we worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings, and Lord, I pray that you'd bless the giver, bless the gift, and I pray that you'd use it um, to further your gospel, to reach this community, to reach the world, Lord, and we pray these things in your son's precious name, amen. <laughs>
seated for our next hymn. Uh, we're going to be singing Constantly Abiding. And at this time, Kids Church is dismissed. and turn to the book of Colossians, Colossians, Colossians chapter number one, and Brother Roger just before church started gave me uh, some information about our Faith Bible Institute, I know a little while ago we had some testimonies and things about it, but every summer we have a elective course that you can take, and this year starting on... Um, July the 2nd, and uh, these electives, it's four weeks and it's in class. It's not uh, online like previous, like what you do during the year. And it's about angelology. So that's an interesting topic. There's a lot of uh, people wondering about angels and demons things, but this is angelology. So uh, I would encourage you, if you have any questions, see Brother Roger. Where's Brother Roger? Raise your hand, Brother Roger. So everyone, okay, so he's over on the left-hand side. Grab him right after service if you got any questions about it. Uh, but you do need to sign up. The deadline is May 28th. So let me encourage you, if you can be involved with that, to be, and you will be uh, re receiving some good instruction from God's Word, and that's always important. Uh, so, so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Isn't it wonderful outside? I think I was watching faces as you were coming in, and everyone was smiling. I mean, I think it's just because you like to be at church, but I think Sunshine had something to do with it, too. It's just encouraging to see. And I say the Lord's faithfulness from season to season. We might not like the winter season much, but we love spring. We love summer as it comes. And God is faithful. And uh, the Lord gave us a great Sunday last week at Easter. So thankful for the folks who are out and watched online. And let's be encouraging each other uh, to reach folks to come, as Pastor Matt just mentioned a few moments ago, about take some tracks. We're going to have some things in May and June, July and August. I'll try to reach out and encourage our uh, interaction with the community and we need to reach them for Christ 
And uh, then one more thing before I pray and get into the Colossians is the wolves arrived safe and sound in Newfoundland, which is great. And uh, they did ask that we would pray for them as they find a place for them and their gang, all right? Uh, they're looking for a place to live, uh, more of a rental right now. So let's be in prayer for that. I was talking to Brother Caleb this week, and he asked specifically that we pray for that. So let's take some moment now and pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for another Sunday. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, in the seasons, and so many other areas you're faithful, in all things you're faithful. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us uh, to reach out to our community. Uh, they need to know of your faithfulness as well. They need to know of salvation. Lord, give us a, a great season as we get into warmer times now and reaching out uh, corporately as a church. But Lord, help us to have that heart individually as well, to be passing out tracts, inviting folks to church. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us uh, uh, as we serve you and reach this community, I pray for and thank you for the wolves as they're in Newfoundland now. And I pray that uh, you would give them a great time in ministry there as they're just starting off. And Lord, I pray that they will be able to find a place to rent for their family that would be suitable, that would be good for the ministry there. I'm thankful for your goodness to them and goodness to us. Lord, I pray you encourage our hearts now as we look into your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so... I'm excited about traveling through the book of Colossians and uh, in the days, weeks, months ahead. And uh, what do you do? So think about this. Don't answer out loud in your own mind. What do you do to get ready for a journey? All right, so I'll, I'll give you a story uh, for us, for myself. So back when I was 15 years old, my dad sat us down around the dining room table. I still remember this. This was a pretty big moment. Uh, and we were sitting around the dining room table, and Dad tells us that we are going to go to Florida in June for summer vacation. Now, from Newfoundland to Florida was like 50-odd hours of driving. It's a long trip, right? That's, like, that's a mega road trip right there. And uh, so it, at first we thought he was joking, and, but he was serious. So you know what we did then? We got ready for, this is before the age of, you know, a trapedia or canoe or kayak or whatever else is out there, you know, to help you find hotels and things. You know, you just pulled out the old, the old map, you know, and my dad gave us the old map to go over, the one that my grandfather had used hundreds of times going back and forth to Florida. And uh, we pulled out that map and we studied that map. We looked over, so we got to make the change here. We went down I-95 and we had to go around Washington. We had to go around New York City. We had to know the right exits and the turnoffs, you know. And we poured over that map in February and March when the wind was blowing and it was snowing, it was freezing. We poured over that into the spring. And then when June came, we were ready to go. You know, and you know what? We never got lost once. That's a minor miracle, I'm telling you right now. It was proof positive that God exists. It was a miracle. All right, we got down there, we had a wonderful time, but we knew what, how to go because we studied the map. We prepared long before actually going on the journey. We were preparing, we, we, we didn't have any pictures of the turnoffs, we just knew the exit number and, and things of that nature, so we prepared. So then we knew what was before us, if we were in this town, we knew what was around us, so it just helped us as we went forward with our journey. So as we journey through the book of Colossians, the best thing that you can do is to read it. Don't just leave it up to pastor to read it and then bring it to me on Sunday. No, read it during the week. It's a short book. You can read through Colossians every week until we're done. No sweat. It's a small book. But that way it helps you get the most out of this journey. And that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to come to church and just, you know, oh, this is what pastor said, that's good, okay. I want you during the week to be on the journey through God's Word, amen? That's what it needs to be about, being in God's Word, studying and applying it the best that you possibly can. So this morning is a little bit different. It's not as much preaching as I usually do, but I want to kind of give you the background, an introduction as such, and we will look at some verses in a moment, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of background on the book of Colossians, because that way it helps you with your journey through Colossians. And, and we're looking at Rooted in Christ, and that's in the book of Colossians. That's where our theme for this year came from. So the author is Paul. Paul, the apostle, was used by the Lord to pen this book. Was it all Paul's 
thought processes. Paul didn't sit down and think about all this and say, oh, this was good. No, he was used by the Lord. The Lord used his hand to write it. This is God's word, okay? So Paul was the, the, the writer, all right, the human pen, all right? The date that it was written was around 60 to 63 A.D., and it would have been written during Paul's imprisonment in Rome, all right? Now, you can go look at your commentaries and stuff and find guys who would say, this is different, this is no, this is over here. This is what I think is the best fit, uh, and I'm not going to argue over with someone who thinks it's 59 A.D. Well, praise the Lord. All right, I don't really care. The idea is that I'm just trying to help you understand when, what was going on in the world, all right, where Paul was. And the location. So I think this is one of the few times in a preaching moment that I've asked, I'm going to ask the entire church to look at the maps in the back of your Bible. <gasps> Have you ever been in church and the pastor told you to go look at the maps? No? Okay, so now I'm asking you to go look at the maps, all right? Go back in the back of your Bible. If you have, Some Bibles don't have the maps in it, that's fine. But you're going to look at like the first and second, third missionary journey. Mine has all three in the one place. And so in Asia, so it would be considered Asia Minor is where you would find the city of Colossae, right next to Laodicea. So maybe your Bible doesn't have Colossae, but it has Laodicea. It was right next door, all right? So it gives you a little bit of an idea where this church was located, this community was, all right? So it gives you a little snapshot, shall we say. A city of Colossae was one of three cities within sight of one another. Laodicea was one. And then the other one was Heropopolis, which was all situated in the Lycus Valley, which was situated on the Lycus River, all right? And this, these three cities were about like six miles apart from each other, and uh, it was a fertile area. A lot, of, a lot of livestock was there, a real bed, uh, bed, bed, a bread basket, blah, 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 uh, for that whole area. Uh, actually, of the, that part of the world, it was very well known for that. And uh, it was one of the, the clothing and dye centers of that world as well. So a, a pretty busy place. And as far as we know, though, Paul never visited Colossae. We have no record that he did. He might have and never was any record, recorded for us. But he was writing to this church to help combat heresy. And we're going to look at that in a few moments, okay? Uh, some folks who were one to Christ by Paul founded this church. While Paul was in Asia Minor, and you could look at your map later too, you see Ephesus is in Asia Minor. Some people that he won in Ephesus had gone out and had reached the entire area of Asia Minor for Christ. And one of those individuals that he uh, won Evaphras was the pastor of that church in Colossae. As ye also learn of Epaphras, your dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful, faithful minister of Christ. So this church was primarily Gentile in its membership. It wasn't a big a Jewish population. It wasn't a synagogue that we're aware of that was there. So they were very foreign. That they, the Israel and the promises to Israel were very foreign to them. And so Paul mentioned some things about that. I'm going to let you know right now that God still has a plan for Israel, all right? He's not done with Israel yet. Uh, it's another sermon another time, but just a little side note. Uh, and the church, this church, showed strength in spite of some dangerous heresies that were trying to infiltrate. They held faith in Christ Jesus and love to all saints. That's in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 14. And they were busy reaching the lost for Christ. Uh, maybe uh, they had a church service. And uh, their pastor, Ephraim, he got up and said, listen, this week, we're going to try to reach people for Christ, just like we announced this week in our church. I mean, we don't know exactly how they did it, but the reality was they wanted to see people come to Christ. They wanted to bear, bear fruit. They wanted folks to know about the grace of God. They, those were things were important to them. And they were steadfast in the faith. They were staying faithful. And all this seems to indicate that the heresies that were beginning to kind of seep into the church had not yet got a ground, uh, uh, fruit, I should say a, a firm footing, this was becoming a problem. It was just on the verge, and if it was not unchecked, it would cause chaos and havoc. So the purpose that the Lord led Paul to write this epistle was to combat, uh, combat dangerous heresy, and all heresy is dangerous. All right? All heresy is dangerous. We've got to watch out for it. And, that, and this heresy that was appearing in the church, we don't have a name 
for it, and it wouldn't really matter if we did have a name for the exact, if you want to say, broad umbrella of all the heresy that was trying to seep in there. But there's some things we do know about this heresy. It stressed astrology, the signs and spirits of the stars and the planets. Paul wrote, beware lest any man spoil you after the rudiments, the elemental signs of the world and not after Christ. It stressed the the heresies that we're trying to infiltrate. It stressed philosophy. The heresy attacked the simplicity of the gospel. Aren't you glad the gospel is simple? I'm so thankful for that. But we have little children who went over to uh, Children's Church, and Pastor Matt and his colleagues, his, his workers with him, will tell those children how to know Christ as Savior, and a child can accept Christ as Savior. I'm excited about that. Uh, and I'm glad there's no need to make the gospel complex. It's simple. And it, this, this uh, heresy that was filtering in to the church there pride itself on being uh, original and its, uh, and its ability to be very rational. And no, They try to get rid of the simplicity. Colossians 2.8 says as well, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. It focused on the body as evil as a, and as the body was like almost like a prison house to the soul. There are numerous consequences to this heresy. Some say the soul is what is important and the body doesn't matter. So one could do what he or she wishes with their body as long as they took care of the spiritual, the soul, and that, had, that was considered by participating in religious worship and, and ordinances. So living, loose living, became embraced by those who endorsed this teaching because one could live worldly so long as they were religious. Isn't that sound like our world today? There's so many in churches today that live worldly and then are religious on Sunday. And this is the heresy that was being taught in this time. And that heresy was strongly attacked by Paul in Colossians chapter 3. It stressed tradition. It, it stressed rituals, special foods and drinks and, and special days and festivals and man-made rules. And Paul confronted that in chapter 2. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath days. All right? And so there was other things as well. And as we go through this, we'll see numerous things. But all these heresies, you know, at the root of it, at the, at the very foundation, it attacks Christ. The heresy attacks Christ. He, he is the foundation of our, of our gospel, Christ, what he did for us. Salvation, uh, gospel, it's all built on him. It attacks his deity, it attacked his incarnation. The heresy is if man's body was evil and, then, and it would act as a, a prison house for the soul, then God would never take human flesh upon him. Why? Because God would become evil by taking man's flesh. So it led to a bunch of different crazy philosophies and teachings. One was a doctism that said that Jesus only seemed to appear as human. All right? So, I mean, that's really, that's really wicked because it removes how great a sacrifice the Lord Jesus did for us to leave heaven and come to earth. It just, they're saying it just seemed like he was. That's what the word actually means, to seem. Jesus only seemed to have a body. How is that possible to be on a cross and only seem to have a body? How does a spear go on his side if he's only seemed to be there? How do you put hand, uh, nails through hands and feet if it only seemed to be there? Another one was uh, Corinthianism. That said it was a clear distinction between human and divine Christ. God could never, this was the heresy they taught, God could never suffer, he could not uh, die for sin. Paul refuted that in Colossians 1.15, who was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, and Colossians 1.19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Jesus Christ came to this earth, amen? It was real. It wasn't seem like. He was real. He had flesh. He was tempted like you and I. And he used the scriptures to defend against the enemy just like you and I should do. He suffered. He, 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 fa he fainted on times. He cried on times. He's just like us. He was human. 
which is, is incredible to understand all aspects of that, but he came. It attacked the humanity of Christ. In the body of his flesh, he redeemed man. In him, his body dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, again, these are just come some things we'll see as we go, and there's other things that we'll see as well as we go through this journey, as we go through the book of Colossians. But I want you to know that you need to be rooted in Christ. Don't just say, well, pastor needs to be. No, you need to be, and you need to be rooted in Christ. Get in the Word of God. It's a journey. Get in it. Each and every day is new. Get in God's Word. See what it says. Apply the principles. And there's going to be times when you won't like what you read because you're in the wrong. God's Word is always true. We're the ones that are in error. All right, so we need to be in God's Word and understanding it. So let's, let's start off. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from, our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So there's some foundational things, foundational truths, foundational principles here for us that will really help us. So number one, we see the will of God. Paul was declaring that his profession, what the work he was doing, was what God wanted him to do, was God's will for his life. Paul didn't choose this life's work. He didn't want people to think that, you know, it was a mistake or he was just doing it on the whim. He wanted to make sure he didn't make a mistake, so he was following what God told him to do. To Paul, there was but one work, one profession for him, the job that God wanted him to do. The profession he wanted didn't matter, only what got God's will for his life mattered. And as reality is for us today, um, God has a profession for us. God has a will for us. Uh, there's only one profession for any believer, and that's what God wants us to do. We need to make sure that we are doing God's will in our lives. And we're specifically looking at work at this moment, because Paul, Paul is talking about what he is doing. This is his labor. But God has a will for all our lives. And God's will for all of us is to obey him. Amen? That's his will. There's other ones. Uh, his specific will is different for each and every one. God's specific will for me is different than for uh, Reed on the soundboard. But there's still God's will. It's different, but we need to make sure we know it and follow it. If a believer is to follow God's will, that means I'm following, I'm asking God, Lord, do you want me to have this career, this work? You know you need to pray about that? Well, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And I mean, we're talking about marriage, relationships, work. What, what, God, what do you want me to do? If, a, if the believer chooses some profession or career other than the, the will of God, then you're out of God's will, and that's not where you want to be. You want to be in God's will. That's where the blessings are, and we don't do it for the blessings, but I'd much rather be where God wants me to be and God be happy with me than to be outside it. I don't want to be outside where God wants me to be. Not fulfilling the purpose that God has for me. James chapter 4, verse 15. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. I'm thankful for folks in our church who are teachers. I'm thankful for the nurses, health care workers, the laborers, the managers, uh, the trade workers, uh, whatever profession you might have in the church. But if you're looking, uh, seeking God's will, maybe you haven't started, this is the time to ask God, what do you want me to do for my life? And you need to be asking that all the time. God, what do you want me to do in my life? Because the Lord can change direction. Not, we're not going to do wrong, but the Lord can say, hey, you're on this path, I want you to go this way. Now, isn't our God sovereign? Doesn't he work it all out? If that's his will for us, he takes care of us. And we need to make sure that we're in the place where we're obeying God. The profession that God chose for Paul was to be a minister, and in particular, apostle. The word apostle means person sent. The word apostle and the word of God refers to the 12 disciples chosen 
by Jesus and Paul, who was chosen by the Lord. Remember the road to Damascus? That's where Saul, later Paul, got saved and God chose him and said, you're going to preach the word. There's no apostles anymore. They've long since passed away. But there are many called to the ministry. 1 Timothy 1.12 says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who have, put, uh, who have enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. If Paul did anything else, he would have been out of God's will. And I know that God has called me to be in the ministry. I remember as a young fellow, I tried to, I, I mean, I word, use the word try. I looked into with great interest to join the RCMP. I looked to join uh, the armed forces. I was offered a job in a family business, but I knew those were not the things that God wanted me to do. I knew it. And there was times when I tried to push it a little bit, let's make this thing happen. But no, God, that's not what God wanted me to do. And God has an individual plan for you and your life, just as he has an individual plan for me and my life. And if we're going to know what God's will is for our lives, we need to know God's word. That means we're in God's word. Not only are we in God's word, we're obeying God's word. We're following the precepts and, and the truths that we find in God's word. That's how we're going to be in God's will. I've had lots of people say, how do I know if I'm in God's will? Are you reading the Bible? Are you in prayer? Are you obeying? You're doing what you know you need to do. That's the bedrock from there where God will lead you. If you're not faithful to the word of God, if you're not faithful to church, if you're, you're not faithful to find the precepts, you got to get that right. Then go forward. Then follow where the Lord will have you. Now, if, if we... Uh, if we get out of God's will, if we do something on our own, and we know it's not what God has for us, it's going to cause us hardships. It won't be fun. It will not be enjoyable. But if we do what God has for us, I'm not saying that you'll make more money or you'll have more things. That's the last thing I'm saying. But you know you're exactly where you need to be, and doesn't God take care of his own? That should be a hearty amen. He does. And the reality is, if we are where God wants us to be, we have the greatest potential of making a great eternal impact for Christ. So he talks about oh, his, uh, his will of God, his, uh, what he's doing, and then he talks about uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Timotheus, our brother. So he refers to a brotherhood, or you could call it a sisterhood as well. Paul mentions Timothy a young disciple. And in other portions of Scripture, Timothy is referred to as his son in the faith. And we know that Paul poured his life into, into Timothy. And his own father wasn't much in the picture. What's mentioned is his mother and his grandmother. And so Timothy had joined Paul to learn all he could about the ministry. He served alongside of Paul. And it's interesting to hear that Paul refers to him not as a student or a son or a disciple. He refers to him as brother. He refers to the Colossian brethren as well, brothers in verse number two. Uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of different relationships in our, in our life. The employer, the employee, the teacher, the student, the merchant, the customer, uh, hey, the minister, church members, church attendees. All the relationships of life are important. And they have a place in our society. But the relationship of the brotherhood is essential. A man and a woman does not walk on upon the earth by themselves. God never created that way. Uh, my, my son was weak. Well, I don't know which one. I think it was my son Matthew. He said uh, he was online playing with some of his friends. He said, we, we created a society for hermits. And this game, I'm like, that's, that's not what hermits do. Hermits don't have societies. They want to be by themselves, all right? The reality is God didn't create us to be all by ourselves, and we went through that with the pandemic, being by ourselves a lot, and a lot of people are suffering even today because of that. God didn't design us to be, you know, very inward focused and all be all be by ourselves. He wants us to be with others. And Paul knew this, and wherever he went, he initiated, he nourished relationships, and we need to do the same thing. And one of the most cherished abilities is knowing how to properly relate and work with people that is a huge thing and it's essential 
for believers in our brotherhood to work together with fellow believers. I'm not talking about ecumenical stuff. I'm just talking about us daily, work with Christians, a brotherhood, the church, working together. It's essential. Within our own church, there ought to be no uh, uh, sense of, of a one member saying, I am superior than you all. You know, it's snobbish. We don't need any snobs at church, all right? They can stay at Starbucks and other places, all right? They don't come to church. Don't be a snob. That's not, that's not the brotherhood. No, and I'm referring to brotherhood as people know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, just so you know, all right? That's what I'm referring to. And looking down on others, my goodness, that's horrible. And you know what superiority already hangs around with, or it probably is uh, kissing cousins with, is pride. Pride. I'm, I, again, that loftiness, I'm arrogant, I'm better than you. What? Do you understand that we're all saved by grace? We are all filthy rags? No one's better than anybody else. I mean, I understand that you might be more successful maybe in business or maybe you have better skills in certain areas, but that's fine. God's giving you a gift. That's wonderful. But you're no better than the guy sitting next to you. You're no better than the sister who's sitting next to you. We're all the same. We're all the same. We need to look to Christ and help us in the brotherhood. And then envy is another one, a, a jealous spirit towards others. It could be envious of the other person's place in, in life. Maybe, uh, maybe their, uh, their position at work, oh, it must be so nice for them to be the boss so they can leave at 4 o'clock and beat the traffic. What? You know what the Bible tells me? Is that I should rejoice that he's the boss or she's the boss. That's what I should be doing. I shouldn't be at home stewing or sitting on the other side of the church saying, oh, well, it must be so nice. Get over it. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We should rejoice when that person gets that increase or they get a promotion. Praise the Lord. I'm excited for you. I'm excited that you'll be able to do more things or have more responsibility. Listen, those things of superiority, pride, envy, and there's a lot more that we could look at. I never want them in that church house of Legacy Baptist Church. God doesn't want them here either. I'm going to tell you right now, those things have ruined other local churches. Hey, as brothers and sisters, let's be encouraging one another. The word says in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor deferring one another. So if you got a problem with a brother or sister, you don't go up in front of everybody and lay into them and walk away and leave them stunned. They didn't know there was a problem and say, I did the Lord's work. I love them. No. No, no, that's not how. No, if you got a problem, the Word of God says, I go find that person and we talk. That's love. That's what the Word of God tells us. If I, got a, I always love picking on Ramo, okay? Ramo's the guy I like to pick on, all right? If I got a problem with Ramo, I don't go tell Gord or my sons. I go tell Ramo. He goes, I love Ramo, he's my brother. Right? And the idea is that be kindly affectionate and in honor deferring, preferring one another. Uh, Philippians 2, uh, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That pride says lift me up, so the Word of God tells us to lift up others, and we be decreased. Look on every man on his own things, but every man also, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Oh, let the brotherhood be strong. Paul uh, was talking to the Corinthians there about their brotherhood. Hey, Legacy Baptist Church, let our brotherhood, let our sisterhood be strong in Christ. It will be strong in Christ if we're rooted in him. Paul mentions maturity to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are Colossae. He mentions saints and faithful brethren. The word saint is absolutely referring to someone who knows Christ as Savior. Maybe a member of the church in Colossae had witnessed to them. Maybe 
they didn't have Tim Hortons in Colossae because that's a newer thing. But maybe they met in the market. Maybe there was a transaction made, and the member of Colossae brought a track, and or not wouldn't be a track was not printed, but he tells them about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, "Come to church. Come to church with me. Come here, Ephesus, uh, preach. You need to know about Christ." And they got saved. That's a saint. That's someone who knows Christ. He told them that you are headed to a Christless eternity. You need Christ, and that person accepted Christ as Savior. They're saved. That's what he's referring to as a saint. Without Christ, they, they had the good news and they accepted. So they're saved. They're a brother and sister in the Lord, but they're not like the faithful brethren. Saved and faithful brethren. The faithful brethren are different. The faithful brethren are, uh, are, are committed to Jesus Christ. The saved here are saved, but they're the saint, I should say, they're saved, but they're not serving as they should. The, the faithful individual is serving Jesus Christ. He's committed. She's committed as best as they can to serve Christ. They're heeding to the Word of God. No, no matter where we are in life, no matter what your age is, when you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, when you accept Christ as Savior, that's just the beginning of the journey, right? Just the beginning of our Christian journey. The Lord willing, in two weeks, uh, myself and my daughter Hannah, we're going to be traveling to Europe. I'm going to be preaching in Ireland, in Cork, Ireland, for our missionary uh, brother Lionel Smith at Calvary Baptist Church in Cork. I'm going to be preaching for five, five different times for him, and then we're going to travel to Holland, and we're going to spend time with our, one of our own, Brother Stan Camps, and uh, the church there in Elmere, Lighthouse Baptist Church. So Sunday, April the 30th, Lord willing, we'll come to church, service. Uh, I know there's a couple of people looking to get baptized. Praise the Lord for that. We'll rejoice. The preaching will be had. Pastor Matt's going to open the word at 9, and I'm going to preach at 11. We're going to fellowship and things. And then after that, uh, me and Hannah are going to go to the airport. My wife is going to drive us up. And uh, it's not going to be a drive-by. She's not going to throw us out. She'll stop. We'll get our bags out of the back of the van and put it on the curb. That's the beginning of our journey, right? That's just the beginning. We have the tickets. But that's just the beginning. All right, so we're not going to stay on the curb and say, Yay! We're on the journey! No, I'll be like, Hannah, get inside right now. I, I'm not a good person to travel with, like Hannah. I like to be three hours early before the flight plane even gets to the gate. I just, that's just me. All right, I'm a typical dad that you might see on those videos of rushing everyone in and sitting down drinking coffee. That's me. All right, I mean, we're not going to stay in the curb, but that's the beginning of the journey, the curb. But we're not going to stay there. We got the tickets are bought. We know where we're going to be when we get there. We, the accommodations are worked out and things like that. Listen. Christ paid for our sins. We accept Christ as Savior. That's just the beginning. We're right on the curb. What? I'm not hanging out on the curb. As Christians, why would you hang out on the curb? I mean, the price that was paid for your sins is incalculable. How much that cost? I got a great deal with Aer Lingus. I'm so happy. I'll tell you about it after, all right? And we got a good price on those tickets, but the price to pay for our salvation is incredible. Why would I just stay in the curb? It's time to go forward. Get going on your journey. Don't stick around on the curb. When we accept Christ, it's the starting point. Again, those faithful saints in the local church, they're continuing their journey. They're serving the Lord. They're sold out. Uh, they're loyal. They're steadfast. They're holding the line. They're the ones praying for others. They're the ones reaching out. They're the ones who are preach the word, Pastor Ephraim. Don't you stop. We need to hear that. They saw, they probably saw those uh, uh, heresies starting to creep in. And they're like, no, that's wrong. That's not the truth. I can remember uh, when we were in Brampton and there was someone had brought in a, a, a false teaching. And they were trying to kind of get some traction with it or talk about it. And I remember one dear saint 
he came up to that person and said, that ain't the truth. He's like, yeah, you preach it. I didn't have to say it. I had members, and I did say it eventually. I mean, I wasn't at that moment, but the reality is they stood up. They were faithful to the truth, and so should you. Be a faithful servant, a faithful brethren. They knew God's will for them, and they were relying on the brotherhood to stand, against, uh, stand for the Lord, stand against uh, the attacks that were coming. You know, folks, once we get saved, we're to follow the Savior, and, and we, that should be, our, should be our goal, to be faithful. It just shouldn't be like, eh. No, it should be our goal. And you know that the Lord wants, throughout the Scriptures, He's wanting His people to be obedient, to be faithful, Way back in 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, and this is it, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. The Lord wants us, just like way back in the day of Samuel, He wants us today to obey. John 14, 21 in the New Testament. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of him, and I will uh, love him and will manifest myself to him. We have his commandments. We're to keep them. We keep them. We show them that we love him. We, we need to obey. We need to be faithful. You know, Legacy Baptist Church is not a building we rent, and it's not a building we might own one day if the Lord wills, it's not the possessions that we have that are, you know, we wrote down what we own on a spreadsheet somewhere. The Legacy Baptist Church is people. It's people. And it's, it's not vague. It's not mystical. Aren't you glad you're not mystical? You know, I'm, you know, I'm looking out in the crowd. You're not mystical. You're not vague. You know, you're real. You're, you're boys and girls and moms and dads. You're married people, single people. Broken people, hurting people, confused people. If it's the saints and it's the saints and the faithful brothers and sisters looking to the Lord for help today and hope for tomorrow, we find it in Christ. That's the church. That's the goal of the church. That is what the church is. We see as well a reference to citizenship which are at Colossae. Okay, so to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from our God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He's the brethren in Christ at Colossae. All right? If we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are citizens of heaven. Amen? We are citizens of heaven. But at the same time, we're citizens, for me, I'm a citizen of Brampton, and I'm a citizen of the country of Canada. All right? So we, we do have a number of, Citizenships, and there's some of you who might have dual citizenships, all right, here on earth. Uh, we have folks who watch online who are from the other side of the world. Their citizenship is wherever they're at. But the reality is the citizenship that should make the biggest impact is our citizenship with Christ, in Christ. Now, I need to be a good Christian who is Canadian. Amen? That's what I need to be. I need to be a good Christian who is in Canada, who is a Canadian. And then we see, lastly here, grace and peace. Two very basic spiritual needs uh, we have is grace and peace. Once on the pathway of the Christian life, we need grace. Do we not need grace each day on an ongoing basis for strength for the journey? You know, journeys are fun, right? We like the idea of going on a journey. I mean, when I was 15 and we went on that journey to Florida, I wasn't driving, but I was with my dad in the front seat a lot, helping navigate. And there was times in that journey when my dad was tired. There was times when my dad was frustrated with the other drivers. And there was times when my dad's like, I'm done driving and pull into a, a rest station. I remember this one time, a little off topic, but just the idea that sometimes we're done, you know, the journey's hard. He pulled off into a you know, a rest station, and I mean, I'm from Newfoundland, I'm, you know, we read the stories in the newspaper about how people are murdered at rest stations, my dad's like, I'm going to sleep, dad, we're going to die tonight, 
you know, that's the, that's the way. And my dad slept in the trailer, and me and my sister were burnt offerings in the van. I mean, dad was safe. We weren't. I mean, anyways, that's a different story. But anyway, there's times on your journey you're going to be tired, and you're going to want to quit. And you need to be having God's grace to keep going. Amen? You need God's grace to keep going. And you know what? There's going to be problems. There's going to be anxieties. There's going to be all different types of troubles along the road of life. And listen, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're lost. We all have problems. We all have anxieties. We all have troubles. The lost thing to think want to convince you, oh, it's all great. No, they have troubles too. We have troubles, but we have Christ. We can look to him and he help us with those things. He gives us peace. When the world goes to pieces, he's with us. His peace is real. When your heart is broken, you know his peace. So it seems so contradictory especially to the world. How can you have that peace when there's such bad things happening? Well, God gives me the grace, and he gives me the peace. The church in Colossae was established a long time ago in a totally different part of the world, and the people were totally different. But yet it's still similar to our church today. The church is not a building. It's a people. It's, a, it's people who have problems, who need a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is growing stronger and stronger each day with the Savior. Where are you? Is it growing? Do you know Christ the Savior? How's that brotherhood? How's that sisterhood? Are you following God's will? With every head bowed and every eye closed. This is time to examine your heart. I don't preach just to preach. I preach for the desire that you would make decisions that help you draw closer to Christ. And there was a number of things mentioned that impact us. That impact us. Are you in God's will? Are you obeying and following the leading of the Lord in your life? Maybe you're not even praying about it. You should start doing that. Start praying what God would have me to do in my life. And it begins with us obeying the Lord. How is it between you and your brothers and sisters in the Lord? Are you kind? Are you preferring to others? Or are you arrogant and demonstrating pride? Are you maturing in your faith? Are you growing in your walk with the Lord? Or maybe... You haven't even made a decision for Christ yet. My friend, let me encourage you to make that decision for Christ today. Maybe you have made that decision, but you're not going any further. You're still on the curb. You really haven't started. Get going. Get going. Be one of those faithful brethren. If you're not in his will, there's a problem. If you're not the good, you're not being that brother and sister in Christ that you should be, there's a problem. Get taken care of. If you're not growing, get taken care of. As the piano begins to play, the altar is open if you want to come or you can just sit in your chair right there and ask the Lord to help you to be that brother and sister in the Lord. Ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Maybe you're not growing as you should. Make, make decisions today that, uh, hey, I need to grow. I, need, I don't need just to be a saint. I need to be a faithful brother, a faithful brethren. Maybe you don't know Christ as Savior. That's the greatest decision of all. And he'll turn no one aside. He loves you. He died for you. We celebrated that last week. Make the decision for Christ today.
Dear Jesus, help us. Help us to follow you. Help us to be maturing in our faith. Help us to be the brothers and sisters in Christ you want us to be. Oh, Lord, we need your grace and we need your peace in our lives. Help us to be rooted in you. Help us to continue in our journey with you. And if we don't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that that person, those persons who come to you, you will turn none aside. Thank you for this time. I pray you bless our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed, and I hope you can stick around for 11 o'clock over in the East Wing.